Welcome back, everybody. In this module, we're going to be exploring a concept that has actually been a component to several of the previous lectures that we've had in this class. In particular, we're going to be linking a much deeper dive into the topic of stereotype. And we'll also be exploring some things that relate to these stereotypes, these things called discrimination and prejudice. And what I'd like to do so we can get started on this and understand some context around the topics that have been explored specifically looking at these ideas, is start us off with a little brief activity. So what I typically do for my in-person students is have them get into groups and awkwardly go through some things that they've learned to assume about members of specific groups. Uh, we stress to them that they, even though they might necessarily not believe certain things about members of these groups, they should also include things that they've heard about members of these groups. The three groups that I have people go through are hipsters, Americans, and elderly individuals. Now, obviously, we can't do this in this online format. But as you see those three groups that you see in front of you, I'm hoping that certain ideas have popped up, certain things that you associate with these groups or that you've learned to try really hard not to associate with these groups. And I want you, with those thoughts in mind, to kind of take that with us to this definition portion of the lecture where we're going to look at how those assumptions are really a critical component to research that social psychologists look at on this topic of, again, what we call stereotypes. So my guess is that many of you, when you saw those names, instantly had images of people that fell within those groups that also possess specific characteristics, be it mental or personality-wise or something else related to it. Well, those generalized beliefs that we hold against, or I guess, towards members of a group are what we call stereotypes. And it's really important to highlight here that in social psychology, we define stereotypes as generalized beliefs about any group, be it positive, negative, or neutral. In essence, if you see somebody as a member of a group and automatically infer things about them, whether those things are, again, positive, negative, or neutral, you're using what we would call a stereotype. And because we talk about stereotypes being linked to both positive, negative, and neutral things, there's a big insistence within social psychology that we want to make sure we understand that these things aren't inherently problematic on their own. In fact, some stereotypes, when accurate, are actually helpful. It's the inaccurate ones that can lead to problems. The classic example that I like to give in my class is if, say, you spilled something in a classroom, walked out and saw somebody wearing some type of a jumpsuit and holding a mop, you might assume things like, well, this person can probably be helpful with cleaning up this thing that I spilled, or might know where I should go to get the things I need to be able to clean this up. That information is based on your assumption that the person wearing those clothes is a janitor and that janitors know X, Y, and Z about the school and cleaning material. And odds are pretty good, you're probably pretty accurate with all of those assumptions in tow. It's when things are inaccurate, and especially when things are unfair, that we start to run into problems. And this is what a lot of stereotype research has focused on. This kind of acknowledgement that, yes, stereotypes, when used correctly, are very helpful, but when used incorrectly, we can run into a lot of problems. If we're looking at the ones that we use incorrectly, it's usually the inaccurate ones, and they're usually ones about what we call outgroup members, who we unfortunately form way more stereotypes about than what we call in-group members. In essence, those that you're close with are what we call in-group members, and those that you don't encounter much are often what we call out-group members. And this can again relate to a wide range of different types of groups that are out there. It could be stereotypes about race or gender or age, but it could also be stereotypes about what 
part of California you live in, or whether or not you are friends with, I don't know, one group of people at your school versus another, or it could be about the differences in people that like watching some show versus another. Right? Stereotypes are very multifaceted. We use them a lot, and we tend to afford them a lot about people that we're not necessarily that exposed to. And when those assumptions are inaccurate or just imperfect, we can run into some of the issues that we're going to be talking about in today's class. And if we're looking at some of the things that come along with these stereotypes, there's two other things that we want to mention before really exploring the research to terms and concepts that we'll repeatedly look at throughout this presentation. And these terms are things that I think I've mentioned before, but we haven't really defined until this point. They're the terms of prejudice and discrimination. For the most part, when we form some type of stereotype about an individual, or we utilize a stereotype when trying to understand an individual, what often follows that is what we call prejudice and discrimination. Prejudice being some type of emotional reaction we have toward those individuals based solely on their membership in that group, and discrimination being some type of well, treatment of an individual based on their membership in that group. Now, again, prejudices and discrimination can be, if we're looking at it from a purely scientific perspective, positive in nature. Right? You can learn that somebody happens to be from the same city you're from and you automatically have very positive feelings toward them and you treat them in a very kind way because you assume that X, Y, and Z is true about them. But more often than not, in research, we focus our attention, even if there are lots of positive prejudices and discrimination that we exist, the way we display, more often than not, in research, we focus on the negative things. So the negative stereotypes that we hold that lead to negative attitudes about members of a specific group, and then unjustified treatment that's usually in a negative way towards those members of the group. There's been substantial amounts of research showing how certain factors can lead to increases in prejudice and discrimination and how these things impact individuals. In fact, there's going to be a lot of these things that we explore in this class. But before we do that, I do want to, since we're defining things, address one last big topic that you might come across when you go beyond this class. Right? Not only do most people researching these topics focus on the negative aspects of things, but some have, because of the, the kind of way this topic bleeds into other topics, dipped their toes into more of a political or philosophical debate on this topic of stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. It's this question of when we can define certain things as uh, what we call ism, what we tend to think of as racism and sexism, but there's lots of other isms that are out there. And this debate that I'm alluding to here is this question of who is allowed to be displaying an ism towards specific groups. There has been a considerable push in multiple communities to argue that you are only displaying racism or sexism if you are a part of a group that has given some type of advantage. If you're part of a, not necessarily minority, but a disadvantaged group, then even if you display specific biases towards members of other groups, and you still aren't displaying what would be defined as some type of ism. This is a tough topic to tackle. Uh, as a scientist, you know, most researchers have contended that, you know, if we are displaying an unfair bias towards some specific group, we're displaying some type of an ism, regardless of whether or not we're in power or not. But it is important to note that there has been a shift within the community over the last couple of years to try to address these sort of political and philosophical issues that have arisen around this topic. So more often than not, when people do study these topics, they reserve those ism terms for individuals in power using certain beliefs or stereotypes to suppress members of a 
a, a, I guess, disadvantaged group. And you'll see that kind of struggle, not only in some of the discussions that we're going to go through in this class today, but also in another really comp important component to this module. This relates to where a lot of these things are coming from, the source of lots of the isms and how these things impact individuals. What we're going to do for another hour or so in this module is not have me lecture on how these things come about and how they impact individuals. And instead, we're going to watch a really interesting, very uh, kind of riveting video called A Class Divided. And this Class Divided video is actually uh, kind of an update, an original video that's a number of decades old now called The Eye of the Storm. A Class Divided is actually a couple decades old now at this point. But I think it's a really great place to start when exploring how certain groups can be treated in specific ways, going back to the ism topic, and also how these things get started in the first place. And this is going to bring us to a really interesting place, not a giant research lab at some major research institute, but instead a very small town in Iowa called Riceville. And we're going to be introduced to this idea not by looking at some famous researcher's ideas, well, at least she wasn't famous at the time, but instead she was a third grade teacher in Riceville, Iowa, a woman named Jane Elliott. Now, her career has spanned many decades since this video that you're going to watch, uh, but I am going to put up a link to the video called The Class Divided, which is split up into different parts on this PBA, PBS website. And I'm hoping that you watch the entirety of that video. Mind you, this is about an hour long video, so you want to give yourself ample time to do that. And when you're done watching that video, I'd love for you to return back to this video and watch the second, well, more than second portion of this lecture. Uh, just a forewarning, there are some phrases and terms that are used in that class divided video that are, are certainly offensive. Uh, and, and I don't want those offensive terms to disrupt the learning process. So if you can find a way to separate out some of the things that some of the young children say in the very beginning of that video and just get the underlying message, I would greatly appreciate it. Um, because I think even though there is some offensive things said, the message is so powerful and important that I don't want to do away with the entire video, even though unfortunately somebody does make a comment that I can't edit out. And well, unfortunately, they chose not to edit that thing out in the class divided video that you see. So like, like I said, if you could go to the link on the class website, watch that video and come back after you're done doing that. Just to check, please go watch the video. This is a image of Jane Elliott, by the way, if you're wondering, kind of an updated version of her and how what she did about 50, 60 years ago now spanned into an amazing career on this topic. So please, again, go watch the video. All right, and welcome back. I'm hoping most of you got a chance to see that class divided video, that you found a lot of powerful messages from it, that you have maybe a little bit more insight than you had before on how not only these things can easily be formed, but how impactful these assumptions can be on individuals and how they can create these self-fulfilling prophecies that we'll revisit later on in this lecture here for the individuals who have these stereotypes and the things that tie along with them, the discrimination and prejudice kind of that, that are applied to them. This kind of topic that, that we watched in that video, I think really does set us up well to explore some of the research that's been done on how these stereotypes do come about, and more importantly, how these things are impacting individuals once they are applied to them. In the end of this lecture, we'll also spend some time talking about how we can try to help people overcome some of these stereotypes when they decide that maybe they don't want them, but are struggling to find a way to 
kind of get rid of some of these assumptions about members of different groups. So let's go on this journey now that we've laid the groundwork and look at how researchers have tried to dissect this wide ranging topic over the years. I think one of the best places to start when we talk about research on this topic of stereotypes, discrimination, and prejudice is an attempt to sort of dispel some of the notions that lots of people come into this topic holding. One of the more prominent beliefs that many people have held for many decades is that a lot of these topics not only are easier to form towards outgroup members, but they might be the only time that we form these stereotypes that lead to, again, the prejudice and discrimination. This is something that's been proven to be irrefutably false by numerous researchers over the years. Most of the focus on this topic has looked at marginalized groups and how even members of those groups might hold a lot of the same biases and treat people in these unfortunately discriminatory ways, even when dealing with members of the same group. The first study that really proved without a doubt that these issues are not just, again, about outgroup members, were a pair of researchers named Clark and Clark, who in 1947 invited a large sample of children that covered many racial backgrounds to come in and play with a number of dolls that they had. At the end of the play session, Clark and Clark offered all of the children the opportunity to take home one of the many dolls that they got to play with, but there was one stipulation, which was sort of the key component to this study, for the kids to get to take home these dolls. These children, when selecting a doll, had to indicate which one they'd prefer and also why they preferred the doll that they chose. And what Clark and Clark were able to show was that overwhelmingly, regardless of the race of the child participating, that most children, back in 1947 at least, focused their attention on the white doll and chose to take it home and often gave indications that they wanted the white doll because of things like it was cleaner or smarter or more pretty. Essentially, many individuals, not only in the group that was not being marginalized, but also the marginalized group, selected the white doll and made lots of derogatory comments toward all the other skin-colored dolls in this sample. One might think when looking at that date that that was obviously a dated issue that we still don't run into today. Unfortunately, this study has been replicated several times over the years, and we have consistently found similar results over and over again. And it really highlights how, again, when we talk about stereotypes, even if they're easier to form about outgroup members, it doesn't mean we don't have them for members of our own group, and it doesn't mean that it won't lead to potential prejudice and discrimination. This is also something found when we look at gender and academic abilities. When Goldberg had college students come in and read an article that they thought was either written by a male or a female, depending upon the experimental condition that they were in. And what Goldberg found was, much like in the Clark and Clark study, regardless of the gender of the person participating in the study, more often than not, people gave the article written by who they thought was a female author much lower ratings than an article that these individuals thought was written by a male author. And granted, he couldn't in this Goldberg study have people read the same article twice, seeing that it was a different author, so there was probably some sampling issues that could have potentially popped up. But according to Goldberg, these effects were so robust that the only way to really explain it was uh, the, this kind of notion that many, both men and women, displayed some type of discrimination in terms of judging the quality of the papers just based on the name of the author listed on the article. And this idea of, again, not holding biases toward our own group members 
is something that we want to dispel. It's why I like to talk about it right off the bat. Another thing I want to discuss is the kind of ever-changing nature of studying stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination in the field of social psychology. Historically, when this started to become a topic of interest, it was, for lack of a better word, easy to study this particular subject. Many people would come into the lab fully admitting to holding strong biases for or against specific groups, and the reported biases often manifested in a lot of their behaviors. And this afforded researchers the opportunity to look at how these things came about, what you could do to minimize them, and whether or not what they were doing was having much of an effect on individuals. Nowadays, people tend to come into labs for social psychology research, insisting that they have no biases whatsoever. And mind you, this would be great if this was what we saw in research. That nobody had these negative, unfair biases towards members of specific groups. But when we look at the actions of many individuals revolving around things like age and race and gender and sexual orientation, big topics that we've been exploring for decades, what we've seen is very little change in the behaviors of individuals, the outward manifestations of behaviors towards individuals that are parts of the more marginalized groups within this research. And this highlights that there might be a disconnect between what people are saying and how they're actually feeling. Now, some researchers have concluded that a big portion of these disconnects are simply because people are unwilling to admit some of the biases they know they have. But other researchers have insisted that maybe these, trend, these trends, these changes, are happening because people on the explicit level don't really think they have these biases. But implicitly, their kind of physical reactions to things, these biases are still lingering. And there have been several tests devised to try to tap into these biases that people might have. The one that's used the most often and has been celebrated the most is something called the implicit association test, where individuals are measured on the reaction time and the ability to pair good and negative terms with specific members of specific groups. And this test is touted to be a means of getting at some of the more hidden biases that people either are willing to share or maybe don't even know they have. And the book talks in detail about some of the studies that have confirmed the utility of this IAT. But it's also important to note that there has been a lot of pushback on this specific test. Many have suggested that the erratic nature of measuring people's biases and the unfortunate ability to kind of manipulate the results however you want, if you know what it's doing, are big indicators that this is not a very good test and that we probably should devise better ones to look at some of the inherent biases that people have and are willing to admit. But unfortunately, we haven't come up with a lot of significantly better ones than the IAT. So even though it's extremely imperfect, it is one that we still use in circulation today if we know we want to tap into a bias that many people are unwilling to admit they have or maybe don't even know they possess it. And this brings us to some other developments that have happened over the years. Another thing that's suggested when we look at why so few people report having biases against specific groups, especially the marginalized groups, is this notion of what we call modern blankism, modern racism, modern sexism, modern ageism, modern ableism, lots of them exist. And what we're talking about with this modernism approach is this new shift in movement, especially in academia for everybody to insist they hold no biases toward specific groups, they don't embrace some of the stereotypes that people project about members of the groups, but at the same time these individuals share this kind of 
discomforts or inabilities to put their finger on it, but, but kind of feelings of awkwardness or anxiety when they're around specific members of groups. This is kind of the definition of what modern, again, racism, ableism, sexism is. And, and this has been around for a long period of time, but has picked up tremendously in the last few decades. Another thing that has started to come to the forefront when we look at stereotyping outgroup members is this idea of something called benevolent blankism. This is where we kind of hold some of the stereotypes that we have towards specific group members, but we sort of embrace them and, and consider them the, the, the kind of positive strengths of members of a specific group. So somebody who, say, displays benevolent sexism would say something along the lines of, you know, women are maybe not as smart as men, but they're so in tune with their emotions and they have the ability to really make everybody feel better around them. And this is often paired with this celebration of women that uphold these tendencies or these uh, stereotypes that are applied to women and an admonishment of women that don't conform to these things. Obviously, again, this is not just about gender. There's lots of different types of benevolent isms out there where the components to these beliefs that could potentially be celebrated and those that possess those potentially to be celebrated characteristics are, are really raised up and those that don't are kind of shot down is something that we've seen in many circles. And unfortunately, it allows for this perpetuation of a lot of unjustified and extremely damaging beliefs that many people hold against, again, not only members of outgroups, but sometimes members of their own group. And this might lead you to ask, where are these things coming from? Why are they still around? Why are they so persistent? Even if we've been trying to dispel a lot of these especially unfounded beliefs about members of outgroups. Well, numerous studies have suggested that there's probably a lot of societal things at play that make getting rid of these things entirely very challenging. Numerous economists and sociologists have shown that when cultures, when groups encounter some type of economic problem, this tends to exacerbate some of the pre-existing stereotypes that members of these societies that are struggling hold. The term that's often applied to this is something called the realistic conflict theory, which suggests that when there are limited resources or when there's some type of problem, people have a tendency to cling to some of the stereotypes that maybe they haven't fully embraced before, but are keenly aware of. A um, classic example that's mentioned in the book is when, say, stock markets or other things crash, people tend to focus their attention on marginalized communities and blame a lot of these things on members of these communities. I'm not going to get into all the specific groups that the book talks about, but if you read more about that in the text, you'll see how... There are lots of real world examples, even within the United States over the last couple of years or decades, where this realistic conflict theory seems to apply. But there's other reasons for where these things are coming from and why they're so persistent even today. Another thing that many people have argued is a key component to children and then growing adolescents forming these kind of assumptions about group members brings us back to the topic of the self that we talked about several weeks ago. If you remember back to that topic, we discussed something called the social identity theory. This needs to kind of define who we are. Well, many people who study this suggest that when we're judging others, we're doing it partially to sort of define who we are. And since most of us do have an inherently positive view about ourselves, it means if we're separating out us from somebody else, odds are pretty good 
or assessments about those others are going to be negative in nature. Another thing that exacerbates this issue is because we are talking about outgroup members oftentimes when it comes to stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination, that not only are we more inclined to hold negative biases about groups of outgroup members, but we tend to kind of jump to those conclusions quickly and just assume that there's this unanimous characteristic to members of those groups after just a few exposures or a few things that we've been told. And this relates to a term that I believe we've talked about before called outgroup homogeneity. This belief that everybody that's a member of a specific group is much more similar than the groups that we're a part of. And therefore, it's much more simple and, well, accurate to create these kind of broad generalizations about members of groups. And if you take these three things and combine them, what I'm hoping you can appreciate is that stereotypes have lots of ways to pop up. And unfortunately, in multiple societies, with some of the things going on, once these things pop up, they can be enhanced and persist with us throughout the vast majority of our lives. Social and cognitive psychologists have also shown through numerous examples and terms that once we tap into specific biases, there are lots of ways for those things to be enhanced and get to a point where we really do start to almost create a world where these biases, even if they're inaccurate to begin with, start to seem to be confirmed for us. One of the terms that's often tied to this is this idea that we, well, we've discussed before called self-fulfilling prophecies. This notion that when we see somebody doing something that leads us to believe something about them, we start to treat them in a specific way. And that treatment tends to eventually lead to that person conforming to those expectations we have. And when we're talking about self-fulfilling prophecies with stereotypes, we're not talking about seeing somebody doing something and assuming something about them as much as we're just talking about seeing somebody possessing some characteristic, you know, be it their height or their age or their race or their handedness or whatever, and assuming all these things about them and because of it, treating them in a way that gets them to sort of act in kind, at least with us. And what can really enhance this even more is that when members of these groups are perceived in specific ways, well, human beings have this amazing knack of sort of biasing our interpretations of their ambiguous behaviors in a way that tends to get us to see those actions as conforming to our expectations. My favorite example of this is actually slightly dated at this point, but I, I think it just epitomizes this concept so well that I still like to reference it over a decade after it happened. For those of you that don't know what I'm referencing, there's an image that's shown in the upper left-hand corner here. It was an image of a very young Michelle Obama and Barack Obama after she introduced him at the Democratic National Convention. It was her introduction of him when he had just been voted as the Democratic nominee for his first run at presidency. And after introducing him, instead of doing the typical hug and kiss that every other presidential candidate had done before, she turned around and they gave each other a fist bump. Now, many individuals on the left perceived this as a cute, endearing thing, showing the kind of atypical relationship they had and how comfortable they were with each other. But individuals on the right saw it in a very different way. In fact, the phrase terrorist fist bump was used on several conservative media outlets to describe the exchange between the Obamas at that moment. And there was actually a, a satire in The New Yorker that sort of highlighted the perception that people on the right had when this event occurred, which you can see in the bottom left hand corner somehow taking this moment and suggesting that we had this radical militia, Michelle Obama, 
bumping fists with the devout Muslim Barack Obama in their celebration of burning America to the ground. Now, obviously, this is satirical. This is a little bit above and beyond, but again, it really highlights the impact that perceptual biasing can have on our interpretation of situations. It gets us with people around us to see a situation in very different lights based on the information we're taking with us into a situation. And what can exacerbate this even more is even if these behaviors that people are displaying about parts of a group are not conforming to our biases, it's clear that they're not. Several social psychologists have pointed out another roadblock that we throw in the way before we're willing to discount some of the stereotypes that we're operating under. And this extra roadblock that we use relates to the perceptual psych topic that we discussed before, which we called the fundamental attribution error. In this case, we call it the ultimate attribution error. If you need a little bit of a refresher on this, the fundamental attribution error was us seeing somebody doing something and assuming that what they're doing is a byproduct of who they are. The ultimate attribution error suggests that we see a member of a group doing something that conforms or not conforms to the stereotypes we already possess, and based on that conformity or lack of conformity, we then decide whether or not we're going to make an external or an internal attribution for the behaviors of that member of a group. So let's say you know we see, well, let's first of all say that we have this unfair biases that or bias that athletes are not good students. And we walk into every situation assuming that if we're meeting an athlete, they're probably not that good of a student. For those of you wondering, I'm not suggesting that that's true. I myself was an athlete for many years, so I promise I'm not trying to insinuate anything with this. But let's say somebody does have this bias and they see an athlete that's struggling in school. The ultimate attribution by error would suggest that when they see an athlete struggling in school, they'll assume that it's because they're an athlete that those struggles are happening. Let's say that same person then sees another athlete that's doing well in school. Well, one would think that would lead them to dispel this notion. But what they do, according to the ultimate attribution error, is they just blame that kind of anomaly in what they see on the person, or sorry, the, the, the environment that, that these people are encountering. So they assume that the athlete with a 4.0 is probably getting lots of tutoring help or is taking really easy classes. And those situational factors are the reason why they're doing well in school, not because there could potentially be a successful athlete in school for just the reason why they're successful. This type of thing, again, is paired with perceptual biasing and self-fulfilling self -fulfilling prophecies and creates this really problematic situation for when stereotypes start to be formed. There's lots of things that can keep them flowing, at least in the eyes of the perceiver. And this brings us to the question of if these things are flowing in the eyes of the perceiver, are they also flowing in the eyes of the perceived? once a stereotype starts to emerge. Numerous studies have highlighted the fact that when individuals are perceived in a specific way, it can have an extremely painful toll on them for, for a vast array of different reasons. One of the more new novel ideas that's started to pop up in our current society when it comes to looking at how marginalized groups struggle with, with kind of overcoming stereotypes is this concept of something called attributional ambiguity, where if a member of a stigmatized group is doing something that doesn't conform to those groups or is treated in a way that maybe doesn't align with some of the negative biases, these individuals are kind of forced to ask the question of, you know, did I do well or did I encounter something in spite of my membership in a group, or was I given some unfair advantage because of my membership in a group, or did I truly deserve what I got, or the, did I accomplish this thing on my own merits?
this ambiguity of whether or not somebody did something despite their membership in some group is a very big issue when it comes to how many members of marginalized groups struggle to not only overcome all the challenges that they encounter, but embrace the successes that they have. It's, it's always framed in the context of their group membership for many individuals. And, and, and that is something that's very tough to, to overcome mentally for individuals that are members of these marginalized stereotype groups. And in fact, what can often happen when these stereotypes are brought to mind is people can feel almost compelled to embrace stereotypes or kind of utilize them, even if, again, they, they don't necessarily support these stereotypes in the first place. One of the concepts that's been studied for a number of decades now is this idea of something called stereotype threat, where it's been shown that members of marginalized groups, when there's something that's brought to their attention about some task they're doing that could be tied up with stereotypes that they support or don't support, can have their performance, once those stereotypes are brought to mind, impacted by the, the kind of reminder of the stereotypes that they're a part of. One of the first studies that highlighted this was one that was done by a researcher named Stone and a number of other colleagues back in 1999. <coughs> in this study, they brought young kids into a, a putt-putt course uh, that were part of a kind of very diverse community. And they told these children, who came from many different backgrounds, one of two things, depending upon the condition that the children were a part of. And half of the studies, kids were brought into this sport, told that it was about hand-eye coordination and athletic ability, and then the kids were allowed to go play putt-putt. And that was it, just simple, this is a hand-eye coordination thing, athletic people do well, go play. And the other condition, kids were told that it was about physics and an understanding of angles. And if they understood how those things worked, well, they should probably do pretty well on this. And what Stone found in their study was that children who were not parts of marginalized communities didn't really have any effect from the instructions that they were given. They performed fairly consistently regardless of what they were told about the nature of putt-putt. But those that were from marginalized communities, in particular those from uh, African-American or black families, tended to really struggle when this game was described as one that was measuring hand-eye coordination and tended to thrive when they were told that it was predicated on athletic ability. This really highlights how once again a stereotype is brought to mind, it starts to change our behaviors even if we don't embrace those stereotypes in the first place. Another place where we've seen this be an issue is when gender and age start to be tied to specific things. Uh, the classic example where we've actually had to shift some of the ways we approach stuff because of our recognition and identification that biases can impact behavior is in the SATs and the ACTs. In the past, these tests and other standardized tests have included questions revolving gender, but what researchers were able to show a while back was that when asked about gender, females did significantly worse on several categories revolving around math and science. When it wasn't asked, their performance was not impacted and they performed at a level that was very similar to their male peers. And this essentially suggested, again, the impact that stereotype threats can have, where even if we don't support a stereotype, it doesn't mean that we can't have our behaviors impacted once those stereotypes are brought to mind. This might lead you to suggest, when we're talking about these things, that maybe we can take advantage of this. In fact, there were two researchers named Robert Rosenthal and Lucy Jacobson that, in 1968, tried to utilize these self-fulfilling prophecies for good when they introduced something that they called the Pygmalion effect, which actually was something based off of an old play. 
In this study, they brought in young kids and gave them what they argued was a future blooming test that suggested kind of growth and aptitude in these children. They had every child take the test and then they sort of randomly assigned the kids to be either bloomers or ones that were going to struggle over the academic career, told these things to the teachers and instructed the teachers not to tell the kids what the test had indicated. What Rosenthal and Jacobson found was that the kids that were deemed as the bloomers did significantly better later on. Many people touted that this was a great example of how we could use stereotypes for good. Right? If we suggest to people that somebody's a member of a good group, then maybe they can get the extra attention, the extra questions, the extra smiles that can get them to be boosted. And many people looking at this closer have suggested that what Rosenthal and Jacobson did was essentially prove an inherent flaw with this idea when designing the study. Because yes, they found kids that were blooming as a result of the suggestions, but they also created a situation where kids that were not described as potential bloomers struggled after being put in a marginalized group. And this always is going to be an inherent problem with using these things for good. You might be able to boost one person by introducing a stereotype that helps somebody feel better about themselves, but that is based on the notion that there's going to be a them out there that's going to be assumed to be a lesser. When you use those things to prop up one, you're simultaneously using things to push down another person. Now, most researchers have kind of gone by the wayside on this topic of using stereotypes to prop people up and have focused their attention on how do we reduce these things? How do we limit these things from impacting individuals in so many different ways? And this is something that's actually been looked at from a number of different perspectives. But one of the ones that many social psychologists have celebrated over the years is the research actually done over 60 years ago by a very famous social psychologist named Musafer Sharif. In Sharif's research, he wanted to control for outgroup biases and other issues. So he invited a bunch of white, young male children to come and participate in what he argued was this summer camp that had some research aspect to it. And within this study, Sharif set up all of these different scenarios in the beginning of the experiment to get boys to sort of bond with members of a small group while simultaneously create animosity towards another member of group, the uh, member group <laughs> group within this campsite that he had set up. Now the initial study, he had the boys, if I recall correctly, pick their group name, and one group happened to be named the Eagles and the Rattlers. But Sharif actually ran multiple studies on this topic to see how shifting things might impact these biases. So he just continued with those terms, eagles and rattlers, for the two camps that he created in this study. And what Sharif was able to show was that if you did create a lack of exposure, if you created competition, if you created all the scenarios that we talked about before that tend to increase stereotypes, even with people that come from similar backgrounds, that look very similar, those individuals will very quickly form stereotypes about members of outgroups and form lots of hostility towards those members as well. But what Sharif was also just able to show in his study was that if he created the right scenario where the boys who hadn't been exposed to the other boys were kind of pushed to come together because of common goals, because of different events where they had to not compete, but cooperate with each other. And he created these standards where the boys were asked to really be treated as equals. A lot of these early hostilities and stereotypes could be diminished, if not completely removed. And this led to this idea of something called the contact hypothesis that suggested that just being around others was enough, was sufficient to get a lot of the stereotypes that we had, especially the negative toxic ones, out. But it's also important to note that many people have pushed back on Sharif's original work. Many have contended that 
this might work great in a situation where you have absolute control over somebody's life and you have people coming in thinking they're on equal footing. But when you have people that don't think of members of different groups as their equals, or when you have individuals that have exposures but no goals in mind, no absolute control over the types of exposures they have, you know, this might not be the best way to diminish stereotypes. And in fact, it might enhance them in some situations when people start to really form this us versus them or in-group versus out-group mentality that sometimes comes when there are limited resources, competition, or other things that could be the catalyst behind the formation of stereotypes in the first place. But nonetheless, Many have contended that if we can control certain factors, the work of Sharif's is a very telling tool that we want to think about when finding ways to reduce stereotypes against members of specific societies in our, well, specific groups, I guess, in our society. But is there anything else we need to address? In Sharif's research, he was able to kind of reduce people's biases by acknowledging that there were ones that existed and then giving people ample time to sort of get rid of these biases. Many social psychologists have contended that if we're looking at kind of a moment to moment basis, we don't have the time nor do we have the resources to be able to diminish and eventually remove all stereotypes. So at least how can we get people to not be really biased towards members of specific groups, especially if they don't want to be. One researcher that spent an extensive portion of her career looking at this was a woman named Patricia Devine, who noticed the changes that people were displaying in their descriptions of their biases, the stereotypes they had about members of specific groups, and wanted to see if she could find ways to get people to get their descriptions to align with their behaviors. Something that, again, we've mentioned is an issue with lots of stereotype research where people say they don't have biases but still act in ways that seem to conform to them. And what Devine was able to show in numerous studies was that one of the key components that seems to be critical to get people to kind of overcome some of the negative stereotypes that they don't want to embrace is to give people some time to recognize the biases that might be a player in some of the things that they're encountering. Get people to assess what they think they have in terms of the biases. And if they don't have specific biases, give them the time then to reject those biases. And granted, we don't give people hours or months to overcome biases in studies like this, but what Devine was able to show is that if people were presented specific stimuli and told, hey, this might relate to a racial or a gender or an age or, uh, again, height or whatever, there, there's a lot of different biases we could top into. People were told, here's a stimulus. Don't be impacted by these things unless you support these biases. And was, she was able to show that people were often capable, when that was brought to our attention, to not act in a discriminatory way, at least if they didn't support the bias. But if everybody was rushed, we tended to just operate with those kind of knee-jerk reactions that led to lots of biasing, even if we didn't necessarily argue we supported those beliefs. And in fact, this is something that can be tied back to that concept of automaticity that we talked about way back in the social cognitive lecture. If you want more information on this, I encourage you to read this section in the chapter because it really highlights the amazing insights that Devine was able to generate with a multitude of different tests on this topic. And I think that topic of Devine's research is a pretty good place to end this lecture on. <clears throat> kind of a high note that suggests that if we create the right situation, we might not be able to change everybody's minds, but we can at least get those who have changed their minds or thought they've changed their minds to be less prejudicial and discriminatory. And that means, as we're getting to the end of this module, we're also getting to the end of the material pretty darn soon. We've got one more module left.
And this module, much like this one, is going to bring together a lot of topics that we've been discussing throughout the semester when we explore, well, a new topic. In particular, we're going to be looking at social psychology and the law. So make sure as you're getting yourself caught up that you're reviewing some of the old stuff, you're making sure that you get everything done with the assignments, that you're ready for the upcoming exam. If you have any questions about these things, feel free to contact me or reach out so you know the path that we're going to take. But for today, I'm going to bid you adieu. I hope to see you very soon. But in the meantime, take care all.